Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 247 at block height 660,220 on Sunday, December 6th. What is up, Janine? Uh, well, it's still dark. Sounds like a perfect environment to give Michael Saylor a tug job. Yeah, yeah, not too happy about that guy. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, you know, to, to to go a little into stupid Twitter drama, I had the pleasure the other day of um of some idiot reading about how Michael Saylor just buying bitcoins for himself does so much for this space. Um, but Jack Dorsey, because he bought a fraction of the bitcoins that Michael Saylor did, does nothing for this space. Despite having an entire nonprofit company, um, putting lots of money into open source privacy grants, um, funding an open source payment processor, um, numerous projects on the Lightning Network. But because he didn't buy as much Bitcoin as Michael Saylor, what the fuck has Jack ever done for Bitcoin? Hong Kong! Who is this person? I don't want to call them out by name. That's mean. I don't want to get sock puppet mobbing going on. Are they a big deal? Uh, it's one of the Bitcoin clubs. Okay, that doesn't narrow it down whatsoever. Exactly, I'm trying to just vent, not, not incite mobbing on Twitter. Okay, well, that's a terrible take. Um, if you measure what someone's done for Bitcoin on the basis of how much Bitcoin... In that case, I have done absolutely nothing for Bitcoin because I've never bought Bitcoin. Oops. Yep. I guess, I guess everybody Great logic. running around... Everybody running around doing stuff, they're, they're irrelevant to Bitcoin. Well, no. So the key factor is, did you buy the coin? Did you make number, number go up by, you know contributing to some trading database and it's like i guess no i di i did not do that so i have done absolutely zip too bad yep. for me i guess and you know you know luke this year you know how he's had to spend a lot of the coin he's had um to take care of his massive family well guess that means he's not done jack shit for bitcoin not done a thing so wait if you sell bitcoin does that mean that like the amount. He's an enemy of Bitcoin. Luke is an enemy of Bitcoin. Oh my wow. god. Didn't we all know that? <laughs> but yes, everybody listening, this is how the logic of an idiot works. Wait, so, um, because, you know, the Chinese government uh, might get a lot of Bitcoin soon. Does that mean that they've done a lot for Bitcoin? <laughs> Oh, dude, so much. Like, you have no idea how much the Communist Party has helped Bitcoin. They're like the, the, North the, Korea. the biggest worker. Praise the global dictators. Yeah, see how fast that argument spins out? No, thank you. Yep. All right. What do the unstables have to say? Yeah, so this one is really, really idiotic. Uh, so I'm sure everybody has seen the Stable Act um, put forward by Rashida Tlaib um, circulating all over the place. And um, yeah, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, so the, the core details, um, nobody would be allowed to issue um, or even interact with in a commercial way a stable coin um, without getting permission six months ahead of time from the Federal Reserve. Um, 
and other banking authorities, um, having an account at the Federal Reserve, having to have everything backing that stable coin in their Federal Reserve account, um, and without a banking license. So pretty much, um, you can no longer touch stable coin unless you have banking license. And the language of this even goes so far as to say you are not allowed to interact with a stable coin for commercial purposes issued by another party without written consent by the Federal Reserve. So my layman's interpretation of that is potentially, I am not allowed to be paid for something by you, Janine, with a stable coin, unless I get permission from the Federal Reserve. Um, absolute bonkers, delusional nonsense. Um, <laughs> and the well, rationale, hold on, the, the, the rationale is the real cherry on the top before we we get into like all the the stupid craziness that people pushing for this bill are interpreting this as um it's to protect low and middle income people who have trouble getting access to banking services um to protect the innovation that could service these people when i cannot think of a single example stable coins are used for that except for the the recent program we just covered where usdc is being used to give aid in venezuela um poor people do not use stable coins um traders do wealthy people do people actually you know trading these assets on an open marketplace as a trader are the ones using stable coins um stable coins do not bank poor people so the rationale part of why this bill exists, zero out of 10, transparently full of shit. Well, I mean, there are, I'm not sure if I was pressing the play button. Uh, <laughs> there are some people who, I mean, I've seen people tell stories. Um, I mean, I don't know whether you would classify them as poor, but I've seen at least lower income people saying that they're, you know, protecting their um you know if uh, if they're getting paid for example by a company that's not in their country and their country's currency is devaluing then they use stable coins as a way to kind of protect uh the uh value of their you know paycheck um so i wouldn't say that people that poor people don't use stable coins i definitely agree that it's not the main use case it's not the majority of people using it but let's say I mean, let's say, you know, a majority of people using stablecoins were poor. I don't see how this act does anything to help or protect poor people. And I fundamentally, I don't believe that that's the actual motivation. And if it is, um, this is a very bad way to do it because uh, the biggest problem affecting poor people um, besides just being poor and not having enough money, which can be <laughs> caused by a variety of things, for example, currency devaluation. Um, a big problem for poor people is financial exclusion. It's there. It's the fact that they can't access services that give them, you know, financial resources. And so, limiting the number of businesses that can engage with stablecoins uh, does not help them. <laughs> at all at least it doesn't help them in the way that they're proposing to do it um it just increases financial exclusion so i don't understand the argument with that at all and it's really also disgusting for you know relatively well-off people in the u.s government to once again be using poor people as you know a uh what's the word scapegoat for financial uh surveillance and regulation that does nothing but uh make everyone's lives harder and makes them richer because they can find businesses that don't comply uh they can put people in jail which is good for the jail and prison system that uses a lot of free labor uh there's you know it's very not cool to once again be using poor people as a scapegoat where they really don't belong Mm -hmm. and, you know, just, just to be clear, I'm 
kind of calling this bullshit in the sense of speaking to American consumers. You know what I mean? Like there is a decent amount of use in other countries of stable coins, but I'm damn sure that the reason she is writing this bill is not so that people in Southeast Asia or Africa or wherever the hell you want to talk um, can use a USD denominated token to escape their currency's inflation. She, she's talking about poor Americans. And th there is zero use of stable coins as a mean to access financial services for all practical purposes among poor people in the US. Like that that's a total fucking meme. And then like, yeah, how does this help them even if they did? What? They can't just go to a KYC light service or an anonymous service and have banking shit. They have to deal with a a registered bank now who has to go through all the KYC credit check, you know, risk scoring bullshit that usually winds up pushing these people out of the banking system in the first place. That that's going to help them. Yeah. I, I just realized that I slipped up. You're right. Um, yeah. It wouldn't make sense to think that people in the U S government would at all be referring to or caring about poor people outside of the United States. post-nationalist post brain kind of slipped there and thinking that they would actually just care about human beings in general. But yeah, they would at, at best only care about poor people who are American citizens and, you know, not doing anything that they uh, don't like, um, which, you know, doesn't include people who live in America who maybe aren't U.S. citizens and people who are U.S. citizens, but they don't like. So, yep. And then that's not even getting into um, the insanity that some of the advocates and drafters of this bill are, are getting into on Twitter the last few days. Um, for instance, um, resident moron um, Mr. Nathan Tankus, um, I really have a hard time believing that Ethereum will not just seek to get a bank license as a narrow bank if this legislation were to pass. Because, yeah, a computer network ostensibly, and I'll say air quotes here because we are talking about Ethereum, um, with nobody in charge, can totally go get a banking license. That's a reasonable fucking thing. And in some of the conversations um, discussing Rube Goldberg stable coins um, based on smart contracts on Ethereum... Um, I think it was Mr. Rowan Gray, another resident moron, um, makes the argument, well, if we can't find an issuer to go after because it's just a smart contract on a network, well, then everybody running a node is liable for processing all of that shit. So complete bonkers, delusional nonsense. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not even going to mention that. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> I was going to re at Coin Center, um, but that's it's not productive. Um, but, you know, Preston Byrne um, wrote a decent response to this and kind of broke down um, the difference between issuers and all of that interpretation. Sorry, one second. I forgot to turn my space heater off. All right. So um, kind of distinguishing the difference between the attempts to define this regulation to go after the issuers of a coin and then the interpretation of um, all of this nonsense of node operators being liable. And he pretty much like walks out not so much a statement, but a question of, you know, do node operators constitute a um, software platform under um you know, um, 230 to, to effectively be qualified as a neutral platform, not liable for what individuals are publishing on that platform, because the language of that bill is essentially a interactive server, um, that will provide or publish data, um, from numerous users. And again, you know, the whole thing with social media not being liable for what users do. He, he kind of asked the question, um, does a node constitute a server under 230? And if it did, 
or if new legislation were passed to clarify a 230-like rule for node operators, then the nonsense half of this would be complete moot and void. But, you know, that that's still kind of a, a question that's not definitively settled everywhere. And until that is settled, um, a lot of morons pushing this bill are really just like, well, if you're running a node, you're complicit in illegal activity and liable for anything that happens on that network. And um, yeah, th this is going to be a really fun thing to see. And I'm kind of wondering in the back of my mind if this is finally going to be a thing, if, if this winds up passing in any sense next year, um, that actually pushes a Bitcoin case up to the Supreme Court in a substantial way. I have to be honest, when, uh, when I was uh, looking at Twitter this morning and saw everyone tweeting about some person named Rohan, I thought they were, I thought there was some kind of Lord of the Rings <laughs> party going on. <laughs> Um, wow. Did you not think that? Uh, no. I thought of some really old anime from when I was a kid. <laughs> I, uh, I had the, uh, Rohan, uh, theme song playing in my head. Which, uh, basically sounds like a tiny violin, which is perfect. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, th this is... Let let's just say that, um... If Biden is actually certified by the Electoral College vote and takes office next year, um, it's going to be really interesting watching the insane socialist camp in the Democratic Party um, go nuts trying to pass things like this and probably roll back half of the shit that the comptroller has done this year in terms of clarifying um you know, for regulatory purposes that financial institutions are allowed to interact with these systems in a lot of ways. Um, I, if he if he takes office, I think a lot of that shit is uh, going to get rolled back or they're at least going to try. Yep. Can't be having things that screw with the money printer. Yes, and I uh, believe I saw my favorite academic, David Columbia, uh, jumping into the debate and trying to say that Alex Gladstein is in fact a promoter of tyranny because he doesn't agree with the Staple Act. <laughs> okay. I, I disagree with a lot of his politics, but he is definitely not a fucking promoter of tyranny. <laughs> I, uh, every once in a while, if I just want a good laugh, uh, reading, you know, the text of someone who is clearly like hemorrhaging anxiety constantly, <laughs> I go and read his Twitter timeline. Fun times ahead. Fun times. All right. What do we got next? Well,. As scheduled, I released the November issue of This Month in Bitcoin Privacy. It has 12 stories, as I uh, wrote in my kind of synopsis to all subscribers on data acquisitions, draft resolutions, multi-sig solutions, civil liberties versus digital mercenaries, King Canute and CoinJoin Cahoots. Uh, and you can pick what you want to read using the table of contents as usual. And uh, kind of already transitioning to the story, the last story in my newsletter for November was the release of uh, Samurai Wallet version 0 0.99.96, which is, as they say, focused primarily on improving load times, Tor reliability, streamlining Paynim functionality, and the public release of Sorobin, um, the encrypted communication protocol they've been working on for coordinating um, collaborative coin joins and they had previously opened it for public beta testing back in September and in the release post they say that um, types of automated and secure communications are particularly useful when trying to compose complex Bitcoin transactions with multiple parts as such Sorobin can also be leveraged for existing technologies like join market and in development technologies like coin swap and snicker uh, despite the fact that they seem to be uh, maligning 
one or both of those on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, by leveraging Seropin, we can now offer users a reliable and fast way to get around the QR dance. Uh, and by QR dance, they mean the fact that instead of manually having to share and scan five different QR codes, which is what people have had to do so far, everything is automatically communicated with your collaborator and encrypted private messages delivered over Tor. Um, so yes, that is uh, now available. Um, if you want to try that out and yeah, uh, the one thing that I'm a bit concerned about, and I think you are also concerned about Shinobi is that some of the coordination currently for finding people to use Sorobin is happening on telegram and it's not specifically for Sorobin that they're using telegram. They've been using telegram for a while, but I'm, I mean, I, I guess at the end of the day, if you're using Samurai Wallet, you have a mobile device and you're not sharing your phone number to use Samurai, but you are using a mobile phone, presumably with a phone number. And um, yeah, Telegram, to use Telegram also requires a phone number to use. So, uh, well, <laughs> I'm definitely not a fan of Telegram for multiple reasons. First of all, because it requires a phone number, and second of all, because they do a lot of roll your own crypto that is not only not secure, but most people think that they're using encryption when they're not. That's actually a feature you have to opt into uh, when using the app, and there's just a number of vulnerabilities that have been shown recently. There was an uh, article, I think, who was it from? It was a German media outlet. Um can't remember which one. Anyway, yeah, Telegram, awful app. Um, so I'm a bit concerned about the use of Telegram in general. Um, yeah, so I mean, I would suggest something that doesn't require a phone number, maybe, and has actual anonymity uh, properties built into it, uh, unlike Telegram. But other than that, uh, this is a good development, especially if it can be used with other wallets. Well, um, see, that's kind of my problem. Um, I think for Samurai users, um, this is a good development, as with all the friction removed previously in doing collaborative coin join spends like this um, removed, it is a lot more likely that the number of post-mix coin joins are actually going to be two parties involved and not just a single party um, kind of faking that with their own coins, which I suspect um, is the large majority of those transactions prior to this. Um, so that I think for Samurai users is a good thing, but I don't foresee this being plugged into other apps. And I think the reason that like, Pretty much, I think this is just more disingenuous marketing here, um, given that there were already two previous BIPs for an endpoint connection in a QR code to connect with somebody over a, a Tor hidden service directly after scanning a single QR code for pay joins, um, the original bust a bit BIP and the current BIP 78 BIP um, that were there. Um, they're already being adopted by lots of software. So despite the way that they're trying to frame this as something everything else can use, um, there was already a spec um, for this type of private communication that multiple things are using. And Samurai has chosen to, rather than implement that, construct their own scheme this way from scratch and now put out the marketing nonsense. Well, anybody can, nobody's going to use this. There was already an existing spec that's being implemented by multiple projects. So that aspect of it, I think is just disingenuous marketing. I mean, overall, I think this is a big improvement for Samurai users, but the way they're trying to frame it like that is just wildly disingenuous in my mind. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I don't know my main concern, uh, cause like if you're if you're marketing it as a tool to, you know, you have privacy and anonymity with your transactions to some degree as much as you can with Bitcoin, but then, like, I mean, it's not a requirement, I should be clear, it's not a requirement to use Telegram to then use Sorobin, obviously. It's just that they're encouraging 
uh, people to kind of, you know, get in contact with each other through Telegram to coordinate um, with, you know, starting to use it. And uh, kind of if you're using Telegram that, I don't know, I feel like that kind of hinders or impinges on the benefits of, you know, a supposedly anonymous uh, private communications channel if you're starting off with Telegram, because, yeah. I mean, so I would rec- Sorry, I, I was just going to say, like, I, I agree entirely, but just in fairness, like, there is the way they've built this around pain ims the problem of coordinating that. Like, you somehow have to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's true. It's just there, there are a lot of better... Uh, communications apps besides telegram <laughs> for that i'm <laughs> just saying mm-hmm. but you know nitpicking aside though this is a good improvement for their users at least right, what else do we got yeah so what else we have uh oh one second so on December 2nd, the Raspberry Blitz project released version 1.6.2 of their Bitcoin and Lightning node system, in addition to um, including an update for the release of Join Market, which has native SegWit uh, in the order book. One of the new applications added to the suite is the Sphinx Chat relay server. Uh, which is something Shinobi covered. uh, Well, you covered the beta release in episode 216. And the purpose uh, of adding that to Raspberry Blitz, as stated in the release notes, is to allow people to plug into Podcast 2.0, which if you remember a few weeks ago in episode 243, I covered a demo that Adam Curie shared of a lightning-powered podcasting platform towards the end of November and he went on Tales of the Crypt with Artie Bent to talk about it in episode 210 um, of theirs about his experience as a podcaster and why he was doing this experiment and how he thinks it will change the way that people engage with podcasts. So, Shinobi, do you think uh, Block, Block Digest should join Podcast 2.0? I mean, yeah, I'm definitely interested in poking around and trying out. Um, I mean, I'd still want to, you know, distribute shit freely elsewhere, but what the hell? Well, yeah, so I, I should point out, um, as far as I understand it, because um, I listed the episode that he did with Marty, and as far as I understand it, um, the distribution of the episodes is still... Don't, like you still have access to them for free if you can't pay um the the paying part is uh on a pledge basis so it's i mean i think they're kind of exploring different options for how people can pay but it sounds like by default um it's still going to be available um it's still going to be available for free and you just have the option to make a pledge well then, indubitably, um, I just found another thing to toss on my pile of stuff to tinker with. Yeah, and I uh, also, I, I don't want to jump the gun or overpromise at this point, but there may be a somewhat soon-to-be-released new podcast that may be distributed from day one through this thing. Wink, wink. I'm looking forward to that like everyone else should be. Glare. Alrighty, we gotta talk about some douchebags. And who might they be? The military. So on November 19th, um, the Venezuelan army has set up their own um, crypto mining operation um, under the supervision of Sunacrypt, the regulatory body, and with involvement um, from Crypto and Trading, a private company down there. And um, yeah, uh, the Venezuelan military is going to be mining to acquire funds that cannot be seized or censored or restricted through international sanctions. Um, Under a specific um, anti-blockade bill, that the National Assembly passed in October. So, yeah. Um, 
the dictators are here and they're going to use it. And I just have to say, I am very much not fond of the idea of a nation's military independently amassing Bitcoin as a funding source for itself, um, let alone thinking about the issue of the Maduro regime acquiring funds to finance stuff like this. Um, how, how are these coins being stored? Who has the keys? I mean, I see the potential here if all of those coins are managed by the military, the keys are held by military figures, um, then the Venezuelan military is going to kind of start stockpiling Bitcoin that the government has no control over. So just aside from that shitty government potentially, um, you know, having access to a, a revenue source like this. What if it's just that shitty government's military that unilaterally is accessing a revenue source like this that the government can't check them on? Yep. That starts opening very interesting doors um, that I would prefer not get opened. Speaking of uh, interesting doors that I don't want to be opened, uh, Decrypt Media is currently advertising steve wozniak's token cool i don't even want to talk about that why'd you do it steve why'd you do it which steve both steves all the steves including mr hoddle <sighs> it just really sucks when you see smart people do scammy things ah boy all right, well, next up is a little quick notice. Um, but yeah, uh, for those of you who remember what Block is, um, Jeff Garzik's Blockstream Lite, um, that's just a meme clone copy of whatever Blockstream does for the most part, except worse. Um, a while ago, spun off a uh, subsidiary called Titan that was pretty much working on a software management stack for mining operations. Um, they're now going to be spinning out their own pool um, specifically to try and pull hash rate away from China. I'm not sure if they're specifically speaking about hardware or just um, away from Chinese pools, but it's just a very quick, um, ad blurb on decrypt of all things um you know mentioning this and specifically the thing that caught my eye is um a comment regarding reducing jurisdictional issues for transnational miners um so i'm, I'm thinking this is specifically related to pools um based in north america but mining in china so um i'm gonna put my bet down right here that this is going to be another fucking regulatory compliant bullshit pool um like douche dicks up in canada um talking about doing mining in a regulatory compliant way and getting ahead of ofac and fat or fatf concerns with mining uh, I'm, I'm putting my chip down i'm making that bet um it's probably where this pool is going to go Yep. Jeff is back on the attack. Alrighty. Would you like to lead the way down the rabbit hole of paranoia? Well, it's not paranoia anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the last several months, you may have heard about a Swiss-based company called Crypto AG. I know, great name, uh, that has been selling encryption equipment and technology to governments around the world for decades while being secretly owned by the CIA and the BND, which is the German Federal Intelligence Service. And along the way, they were backdooring these devices. There is a... Uh, Oh, a second Swiss company that is being implicated in similar shenanigans, Omnisec. And I'm basically just going to read word for word uh, from the Swiss Info 
article that was published in English because this is fantastic. Um, according to the SRF, which is the Swiss Radio and Television uh, Broadcasting Service, uh, sources from the SRF, um, Swiss cryptologist and professor Ueli Manuri, I don't pr- pronounce these names, Swiss cryptologist, was a consultant for Omnisac for years and told uh, the SRF that in 1989, U.S. intelligence services... Uh, National Security Agency, in quotes, uh, contacted Omnisec through him. Of course, or of concern, are the OC500 series devices. Devices were sold to several Swiss federal agencies. However, Swiss authorities only noticed the devices weren't secure in the mid-2000s. Several Swiss companies also received manipulated devices from Omnisec, including Switzerland's largest bank, UBS. Omnisec, founded in 1987, manufactured voice, fax, and data encryption equipment. It was dissolved a few years ago. The most recent head of the company, Clemens Kammer, uh, told SRF uh, that Omnisec customers have and will continue to get value on security, confidentiality, addition, and reliability in business relationships. Some politicians uh, have called for further investigations into these latest allegations that may reveal who, if anyone, in the federal government knew of Omnisex business affairs with foreign intelligence. Um, Earlier this month, a nine-month investigation by the Swiss Parliamentary Audit Committee uh, GP Dell found that the Swiss intelligence service knew that the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency was behind the Swiss-based crypto AG as far back as 1993. The report says that the Swiss Woo! intelligence later collaborated with them to gather information on foreign sources. More than 100 countries bought encryption devices from the Zug-based company, which did business under the guise of Swiss neutrality. Okay, now do Intel. <laughs> yeah but that's a boring one the more interesting one is the one under the guise of swiss neutrality no one thinks that intel is neutral except know, for it's moxie just... and his sgx obsession <laughs> it's it's just the the more i see this shit it, it's like how long until the equivalent comes out for general purpose computing systems. I mean, like it, it's like, how long? I mean, like, come on, like th- this type of targeting is going on for the entire history of computing. What, what, what are they doing to all the shit we're using? Yeah. Uh, remind me again, aren't these the same intelligence agencies who are demanding that we surrender our privacy and liberty in the name of national security that we are supposed to trust them? And yet you have intelligence services, uh, well, the intelligence service of one of the wealthiest and most peaceful countries in the world, knowingly allowing foreign spies to compromise the security of their own government and their own citizens. Personally, I'm not surprised in the slightest. As far as I'm concerned, these fuckers are the real national security threat. And sure, some of the lower level cogs uh, may care about security and misguidedly believe that that is the purpose they're serving. Uh, But the ones running the joint, uh, it's just about power for them. They will let people die if it means they can acquire more power and knowledge. And they're the worst kind of information junkie that exists. So please wave this story in their fucking faces the next time they even suggest that anything they say in the crypto wars is credible. Yep. Who will hear me? The guy at the monitoring station. Oh, I see. Well, fuck you, buddy. (laughs) Whoever you are. Woman, man, whatever. I hear that the intelligence services are increasingly diverse, and I can say fuck that. I don't want my war criminals to be diverse. (laughs) I don't want war criminals. Yeah, I mean, I don't want them, period. But, like, it is not anywhere on my radar to say, I wish there were more women (laughs) in the NSA or the CIA. Because guess what? Uh, Yeah, the CIA and all of their torture programs were headed by a woman. And they still happened, and it solved nothing. Because guess what? Women can be evil, too. Stop treating us like babies. Alrighty, are we ready for some comedic relief? Are you saying that this wasn't comedic relief? (laughs) 
not of the presidential variety. Oh, I see. So back in September, um, Nicholas Dorier from BTC Pay and Chris Stewart from Short Bits um, created an on-chain DLC to settle the U.S. presidential election. Um, Chris put 0.6 on Biden and Nicholas put 0.4 on Trump. And they pretty much um, used the basic um, outcome observer um, tool that they've written up um, and published everything through a, a Twitter bot that it's running. Um, and this was settled uh, the 24th of November um, in favor of a Biden win. And uh, I'm sorry, Nicholas, um, the whole election is a joke. Um, it's a lie. Chris robbed you. Um, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's just, you know, really interesting to see. Um, you can literally run this type of thing over a Twitter bot and trustlessly settle out a, a contract without having to interact with the Oracle, without an Oracle knowing that you're using them. And it works. Now, if there is a God, he will create the crazy path that will break this country apart where Trump wins anyway. And I'm going to really enjoy if that happens, although it probably won't, um, just because I can start trolling Chris to give Nick his money back. <laughs> so if there is a God, come on, man. I want to see all these fucking bets that settle out for Biden get wrecked. <laughs> yeah, so I have to I have to say when I saw this on the news desk, um my first thought of DLC it was not what you were talking about. It was some kind of video game that would release some kind of extended edition of the <laughs> of the election. <laughs> Which is horrifying because it's already in a DLC phase. Uh, yep. Let's see how much new content they have for us. All right. Next thing up is um, I'm sure everybody has seen this uh, project being worked on for a while now, but uh, Spectre Wallet um, now has a Pioneer Edition kit for the DIY um, build your own hardware wallet that they put together. And I do want to kind of quickly run through uh, Lazy Ninja's interpretation of this. Um, so first off, um, I'm not really sure how I'd feel using this for anything single sig. Um, but I think this is a very useful thing in terms of, um, you know, being a participant in a multi sig wallet. But um, the QR code reader for the camera is actually isolated through the serial port. So there's a pretty decent barrier between the MCU on this. Um, you know, big screens equal nice UIs, easy to use. Um, and you can actually um, buy a Java um, smart card um, to kind of manage key signing with this or um, actually store the keys on the device. So that is a pretty nice, flexible um, security situation there. But given that it's a smart card, um, you know, there's no screen on a smart card. So if your device were potentially to get compromised, you know, you can get tricked, use the smart card, and there, there's no way to verify what that smart card is signing except the device that would be compromised in that situation. And also just the fact that this is kind of a developer board. And he says, and I'm, I'm going to trust his experience here because he is uh, one of the hardware hackers who is genuinely finding a lot of problems with hardware devices in the space. Um, but those get revised um, a lot more frequently than production level boards um, and could potentially, you know, somebody could potentially buy the components for this. Um, there'd be slight changes to the hardware and them not notice that. But, you know, um, and it really is last criticism is just the fact that there's no 
kind of real revenue model here. Like all of these are off the shelf components that somebody can find anywhere and, you know, just do it themselves. So on one side, that is a big benefit in terms of supply chain attacks. Um, there's a lot of diverse places to source these materials, but on the other side, um, given that there's no real revenue for Spectre, um, he's kind of skeptical of long-term security, bug fixes, support, and so on. But all of that said, um, I'm assuming if you're using Spectre, you're probably playing around with the multi-sig functions. Um, I think this is a pretty you know, balanced device, um, not crazy expensive to include in a multi-sig because... Um, I don't know why the hell not spread your risk around a little more when you can. Mm -hmm. All right. Last thing. This is really fucking cool. Super awesome. Crypto autism. Go. So Jonas Nick, um, four days ago threw up a proof of concept for doing ring signatures with taproot outputs because they expose the main public key. Um, so that allows for support of ring signatures, which is problematic um, when you only have an address hash available. So um, he put together a very quick um, implementation here that would allow you to create a ring signature um, for your taproot output over all of the taproot outputs in the UTXO set. So you, you can effectively cryptographically prove that you own some output without actually showing which output it is and hiding in the entire taproot set of outputs. And so this is a very basic implementation um, using the, the Borom Boromian ring signatures implemented in the LibSec uh, P256K10 knowledge proof library. Um, so it's not really useful for a lot of complex things so far, um, such as, you know, fidelity bonds, um, staking certificates. Um, but there is the potential to kind of expand the implementation of this and give it different properties so that it could be used for different things. But overall, um, you know, this being built out to what it really could be would be fucking awesome because you could have all of the collateral benefits of something like a fidelity bond, which uh, Chris Belcher has been looking at a lot for join market, as well as uh, the coin swap implementation he's working on without specifically doxing an individual UTXO. So that would be a hugely fucking awesome thing to get with Tabroot. So what you're saying is that Bitcoin can be Monero? In a very narrow fac or facetious way for off-chain proofs of stuff, yes. Cool. So super-powered crypto autism segment done. My um, turn? I do believe it is, and I am actually waiting uh, to hear the details of this because I only had a chance to take a quick glance at it. Yeah, so yesterday I was looking into uh, a, how did it come up? I think it was either Hacker News or someone retweeted it into my timeline, but I looked at a project called Radical, R-A-D-I-C-L-E, uh, which uh, has only just released their beta desktop client, and I still don't know too much about them. Um, just looking at their kind of organization and GitHub, it looks like mainly Berlin-based developers. Um, who I don't recognize, but it was interesting enough for me to mention after looking at it because it's of interest to me and my work, I think. Uh, basically, they're trying to build a peer-to-peer -peer network for Git-based code collaboration. It's written in Rust, at least the, um, the client is, or I can't remember if it was the client or 
the protocol for <clears throat> the network that they're making, but on their website at docs.radical.xyz, they write, the Radical stack is open source from top to bottom. There are no closed components. Every component of the Radical stack is auditable, modifiable, and extendable. Radical is uh, built entirely, should be built, I should tell them to, I can make a pull request, haha. <laughs> <laughs> Radical is built entirely on open protocols, there are no special servers, privileged users, or companies in control of your collaboration. Radical is based on a peer-to-peer -peer architecture instead of a client-server model. It is not global by default, instead the social graph appears in projects uh, you track, determines what content you see, interact with, and replicate. Radical is designed for bazaar style development. Bazaar is in B-A-Z-A-A-R. Uh, this means that within projects, there isn't a single master branch that contributors merge into. Instead, peers maintain their own views of projects that can be fetched and merged by other peers via patches. Um, and then they also say that they have plans to use Ethereum to some degree. Their website lists it as an opt-in feature. Um, it just says hard the power of decentralized organizations and digital money, fund and sustain, sustain your open source work without relying on intermediaries. And then the roadmap says that in early 2021, they will add an option to register global names, collectively manage orgs, and link crypto wallets with their Ethereum integration. So basically, they're going to allow, like, because obviously, if you're if you're going to have usernames or whatever, um, if people care about, you know, is this uh, username unique? Does it actually correspond to the person? I think it does. Um, you need a way to prove that. That's, you know, a lot of stuff has been done with Bitcoin prior to Ethereum even existing. And then Ethereum kind of took over a lot of the really complicated, well, they tried to take over a lot of the complicated projects that people weren't uh, able to do with Bitcoin as as extensively at the time and so it sounds like they're just going to add in a crypto wallet but as i read beginning they say that you know you can modify it yourself so i'm not interested in using the ethereum aspect at all but as long as it's optional then as long as the code doesn't bloat the project the rest of the project um i am hoping that enough bitcoiners will be interested to maybe fund development of bitcoin integrations because i would actually use those and i think there already are some bitcoiners interested in doing that i'm sorry i i need to wash the, the puke out of my mouth when i heard ethereum <laughs> hey hey show me at least they made it optional can developers please just learn that ethereum does not magically do anything because it's like i love the fucking idea of a peer-to-peer -peer way to coordinate and access git repos um especially with the, the little incidents marching forward that have github um acting more and more questionably but come on stop with the ethereum bullshit oh my god yeah, so I, I should point out, like, I read it because I, you know, I saw Ethereum and I was like, I have to point this out because I'm, I'm obviously not interested in it. But in terms of when you look at their website and documentation, Ethereum is like, it's barely mentioned at all. It's not like a focus of their project. This isn't like an Ethereum focused um, effort. That's just a side of it. And they're also very early, so... Anyone who does have a problem with that can express it. Anyone who wants to take it in a different direction can do so um, because it's literally just been released and yeah. Ray! Well, let's hope they learn quickly that ETH is a pointless meme so they can rip that out and actually build this into something that'll go somewhere. Yeah, I mean, all I can say is uh, look at what happened to Brave. <laughs> Yep. Let's hope that does not happen again. Alrighty. What, what do we got in terms of thoughts, jokes, BS to, to spew out of our mouth before we, we call it quits? Uh, well, just to reference back to the, uh, the first story today, um, I think I didn't say it, but my favorite response to the senator whoever the guy is i don't even remember if it was rohan or a different dude 
but there was like several people that I saw responding to the claim that, oh, well, you're running a node as part of a network, you should be held responsible. And they were like, I would like to introduce you to the internet. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like the logic of that is so absurd. It's like, like, how far do you take that? Like, if, if I have AT&T and engage in a terrorist conspiracy, is AT&T liable for facilitating terrorism? Yeah, I believe that there are a number of laws that apply to that question, and they say no <laughs> for very good reasons. Yep. Yeah, th this is like the hard point of all of this shit for so many idiots in government. Um, you cannot just apply finance regulations to this only and ignore the fact that it is software. And there's also very clear regulations and, and laws regarding software. And you can't just violate those laws um, applying finance laws. Um, that's going to get really sticky and people with money on the line will take your ass to court. Yeah, and uh, just in another hilarious thing that the government did to laugh at, well, it's not something they did, they kind of, but the fact that this case is even in being heard is ridiculous. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, recently heard um, a number of arguments related to the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is like such a stupid law that has been abused against so many people. Um, they heard arguments about how scraping is, uh, how, why it should be considered hacking or not hacking. <laughs> And I just find that Jesus hilarious. Christ. I I find that hilarious because <laughs> I it, I am a master scraper. I do a lot of scraping, and by that I mean I use web archive services a lot. So if scraping is a crime, <laughs> I am so screwed. And apparently, I am a great hacker. Load website in web browser legal. Load website with other program crime. Go to jail. Don't obey robots.tx. Terrorism. Jesus Christ. So, uh, if Government you're interested, is stupid. If you're interested, um, one of my uh, favorite news outlets, the Markup, uh, which the reason it's one of my favorites is because I think they're trying to do a lot of interesting stuff with presentation, uh, particularly the fact that they try to. Ha give credit to everyone who contributes to a piece, not just the the uh, headline author in the byline. They actually give credit to everyone who contributes, like a movie, as Julia Agwin says. And uh, they have t-shirts that you can buy called Scraping is Not a Crime, and it looks great. So, uh, yes, I would recommend that. <laughs> well, I guess my final thought before I take us out is just this simple. Remember, everybody... Michael Saylor has done exponentially more to help Bitcoin move forward than Luke Jr. Because he has more Bitcoin than Luke. That is your public service announcement. We'll catch you later, punks. Bye. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet.